We're going to use some silica which has been sprayed onto an aluminium sheet. This is called a TLC plate. We use the properties of the silica and the properties of a solvent to draw the compounds up the plate at differing rates depending on the characteristics of the compound. First of all we need to make a TLC spotter. Heat the centre of a capillary tube in the blue cone of a micro Bunsen burner flame. Rotate the tube gently to ensure it's heated evenly and when it starts to give take the tube out of the flame, leave it for a split second and then sharply pull out both ends of the capillary to form a very fine tube. Allow this to cool and then snap the tube to produce two spotters. We've drawn a pencil line at the bottom of the plate with three marks on. We're going to spot one of the samples on the left hand spot and the other on the right hand spot. We've put a spot of each compound on the middle co-spot so we can compare their RFs. We need to put the solvent into the chromatography tank to a depth of 3 to 4 millimetres. Usually you'll be told what solvent to use. Put the plate into the tank and put the lid on. You'll see there's a piece of filter paper in the chromatography tank, which is a beaker. This helps to saturate the atmosphere with solvent vapours. Once the solvent front has got to the top of the plate, remove the lid, take the plate out and draw a line where the solvent front is so you can work out your RF values. There are a few ways to visualise TLC plates. If the compounds are UV active, you can see spots of the compound under a UV lamp. Use a pencil to circle the spots. A range of chemical dips can be used, which react with certain functional groups producing a colour change, for example potassium permanganate. I will teach you how to prepare and run a column in column chromatography. These are the essential tools and apparatus required to do column chromatography. The glass column and a clip ring. It is green here. It can also be blue but most importantly the size must be correct. An air pump to speed up the rate of elution. Test tubes and test tubes racks to collect your sample fractions. A rubber tubing a glass pipette, a column 1, and a solid funnel. You will also need sand, silica gel, cotton wool, a beaker, and a glass rod. This is how you would connect your pump to the column later on. Insert it at the mouth and secure it with the clip ring. Now, show time. Pinch a small piece of cotton wool and roll it up and use the column 1 to secure it near the stop cock. Do not use a huge piece of cotton wool. And also do not make it too tight, as these two factors contribute to the slow flow rate. Now secure the column onto the retort stand. and transfer sand through a solid funnel. At all times, the column must be vertical. Make sure the sand layer is level. Take two spoonful of silica gel, place it into the beaker,
always caps on the chemicals immediately after use. Add hexane slowly into the beaker to make the slurry. With the glass rod, stir it well to evacuate any air bubbles trapped inside. Make it into a homogeneous slurry. We use the solid funnel for the column so that we can transfer the slurry as well. Okay, add about 5 ml of the hexane into the column. At all times, the sash must be closed. This is to prevent the breathing in of the toxic silica gel into our lungs. You may get silicosis, which is very harmful to our body. So take note, sash must be down. Here in the video, we're just doing a demonstration, so it's up. Open the stopcock for a short while to check that it works. And then now transfer the slurry of silica gel into the column. Be calm and stoic. Don't do it too fast as air bubbles may be trapped. Open the stopcock to allow the silica to settle. Rinse the beaker with hexane and transfer the remainder into the column. Take some additional hexane to rinse the inner walls of the column. Open the stopcock to allow the silica to settle. Take some additional hexane to rinse the inner walls of the column. At all times, the column must be vertical. Use the rubber tubing to tap on the column so that the silica settles even better. Connect the air pump and secure the joints using the clip ring. Check out the flow rate. It's much faster. Keep your eyes on the meniscus of the eluent and never let the column turn dry. The solvent must always be above the silica gel. Notice how fast it is with the pump. When the meniscus is reaching the silica, remove the clip and use your hand to hold the joints to have a better control. Use the palm to push the layer down. Take some additional hexane to rinse the inner walls of the column. And there are no air bubbles present. At all times, the column must be upright. After you have ensured that the silica column is packed uniformly in a compact mode and there are no air bubbles present,
transfer some sand to the column so that the silica gel would not be disturbed when we are running the column. Use hexane to rinse down the sand. Look at this. And this is good. <laughs> the hexane which we collected when we open the stopcock can be used so that, that we don't waste the chemicals. Uh, our sample in this experiment contains chlorophyll and beta-carotene which are dissolved in methylene chloride. So here we are demonstrating liquid loading. Use minimum methylene chloride to dissolve your sample. Use a dropper to transfer the sample into the column. Most of the time, the organic sample is not colored, as shown on the clip on the left. Circulate the dropper as you add into the column. To maximize the yield, wash the beaker with some of your solvent. Open the stopcock for a while. to allow our compound to settle on the silica column under normal pressure. And then add hexane to it. We add more hexane first to rinse down our extracts before we run our column. Keep your eyes on the meniscus of the eluent and never let the column turn dry. The solvent must always be above the sleeker gel. When you are adding the eluent, do it slowly, not to disturb the layer. After a while, you can pour the rest of the solvent in, and now you can apply the enhanced pressure. See the yellow band. It is moving very swiftly down because it's very non-polar. Once the test tube is full, change and arrange the few test tubes in order of sequence. So now we see the yellow band is eluted. Here we are collecting our first compound in this experiment. Fortuitously, the compound is colored here, so there's no complaints. We collect all those in yellow in the same fraction. In a normal synthesis, what you encounter more often than not is shown on the left, all colorless. So how do you gauge if the first compound has eluted, use the fingers and touch the neck of the stopcock. It will feel warm when the first compound is coming out.
At this point, the first compound has successfully been eluted from the column. We will change the eluent to a 1 to 1 hexane to e tau acetate ratio to increase the polarity so that the more polar compound will interact better and can be eluted. Since the new eluent mix is much more polar, you can see that the solvent dissolves some of the compound. But more eluent. Apply the pressure from the pump and collect the fraction in a new test tube. You will notice that as we increase the polarity of the eluent, the more polar compound runs down swifter. Notice how the green band flows down gradually. I saw the meniscus of the eluent. Never let the column run dry, remember. When the green band is reaching the stopcock, we change the new test tube. You see that the second compound is flowing out and the green liquid containing chlorophyll. Here we change the eluent quite drastically from pure hexane to a 1 to 1 hexane ethyl acetate system so the column may see some cracks. Normally we do a gradual increment in the polarity, so these cracks should not be observed. Notice that the exit has no more green liquid. It shows that all the chlorophyll has been eluted. We can change the test tube. We collected the yellow compound in the second test tube, which contains beta-carotene. And the green compound in the fourth test tube containing a mixture of chlorophyll A and B. The first and the third test tubes are just solvents. We can verify the identity by conducting a thin layer chromatography. As mentioned before, most organic compounds are colorless, so to check if the test tubes contains the molecule, you have to conduct the TLC. Watch the video on TLC technique to refresh your memory. After you have finished running the column and have collected all your compounds, put the pump back and eject all the solvent inside your silica gel. Dry the column completely. Here you still see some yellow other liquid which may contain other compounds, you know, which is not part of our investigation. So you can just discard them. You see that the column is drying out? It's good. Now, you're ready to clean the column. 
detach the column from the retort stand and bring it to the film hood allocated that has a silica waste disposal. Invert the column and use the rubber tubing to tap on the walls and to eject the silica gels. If the particles inside are too persistent and stubborn to be removed, rinse it with just a little bit of acetone from the outlet of the column. So voila! HPLC stands for High Performance Liquid Chromatography, but could equally well stand for High Pressure Liquid Chromatography. It is used for separating mixtures, either to analyze the mixture or to separate a required product from others in a reaction mixture. It can also be used to find the relative amounts of different components in a mixture. HPLC works on the same principle as paper chromatography, here shown speeded up. A liquid, called the mobile phase, moves past a solid, the stationary phase. In paper chromatography, this stationary phase consists of water molecules bound to the cellulose in the paper. The mobile phase carries different components of a mixture, called the sample, along with it at different rates. How fast each one moves depends on its relative affinity for the mobile and the stationary phases. For example, if the mobile phase is more polar than the stationary phase, the more polar components of a mixture will tend to move more quickly than the less polar ones. In HPLC, the stationary phase is a solid packed into a column like one of these. This particular column contains silica particles to which C8 hydrocarbons are attached, making the stationary phase nonpolar. In paper chromatography, the solvent moves along the paper by capillary action. In HPLC, the liquid is forced through the column by high pressure pumps. The whole apparatus looks like this. These bottles contain solvents. Two solvents can be mixed in any proportions to give a mixture, the liquid phase, of suitable polarity for the separation that is being done. In this case, one solvent is water, very polar, and the other, ethane nitrile, less polar. The operator can decide on a mixture with the correct polarity for the separation she is doing. These are the pumps. They produce a pressure of 15,000 kilopascals, 150 times that of the atmosphere, hence the name High Pressure Liquid Chromatography. If a single sample is to be run, it is injected into the solvent stream here, in the injection port, via a hypodermic syringe. Alternatively, Several samples can be run in succession by loading them into this auto sampler, which will run them in order without any human intervention. The pumps force the mixed solvents through the column. The solvent emerging from the column and carrying the separated components of the mixture passes into the detector. 
Here, a beam of ultraviolet light shines through it. This light is set at a wavelength that is absorbed by all the components to be separated. When the detector reading drops, a component that is absorbing UV light is coming out of the column and passing through the detector. Many alternative types of detector are possible. This one measures refractive index. The time that each component takes to come off the column is called its retention time and can be used to help identify it. Here, the HPLC instrument is being used to separate a mixture of two steroids used in a pharmaceutical preparation. The column chosen is packed with a nonpolar solid. The tails of the molecules represent hydrocarbon chains C8H17. Having chosen the solvents, detector wavelength and flow rate, a single sample is run by injecting about 20 microliters into the injection port. The more polar component comes off the column first, followed by the less polar. The peak at retention time, 1.5 minutes, represents other ingredients used in formulating the product. This is the pharmaceutical product, and behind it, it's chromatogram. Gas chromatography, GC, is a method of separating mixtures and is particularly suited to mixtures of fairly volatile liquids. As in all chromatographic methods, there is a mobile phase, in this case a gas, that carries the components of the mixture over a stationary phase. In this case, the stationary phase is a tube called a column, packed with solid or coated with a high boiling point liquid. The components of the mixture leave the column in order of volatility, the most volatile first. This is the complete instrument, with the computer control system on the right. The sample is injected here. From this injection port, the sample passes into the column, which is kept in a temperature-controlled oven. Columns are normally wound into a spiral to save space. This capillary column is 30 meters long. This is much shorter, about one meter. The properties of the column and its filling are chosen for the particular separation that is to be carried out. The components of the mixture are carried through the column by a stream of inert helium gas, the mobile phase. The more volatile the component, and the less it interacts with the stationary phase, the faster it travels through the column. At the other end of the column is a detector that detects each component of the mixture as it comes out of the column and also measures its amount. This instrument has a flame ionization detector which consists of a hydrogen flame burning in air. As a substance leaves the column, it burns in this flame, producing ions, which can be detected by measuring the electrical conductivity of the flame. The hydrogen for the flame comes from this cylinder here. Before beginning a separation, the operator must set the flow rate of the gases and the temperature of the oven. 
The temperature of the inlet port is also set at a level that ensures that the sample is fully vaporized. And the flame ionization detector must be lit. Here, we will separate a mixture of methanol and methyl benzene. About 0.1 microliters is taken up in a hypodermic syringe. It is then injected into the inlet port through a self-sealing rubber disc called a septum. The first peak is methanol, the more volatile component. Its retention time, that is the time taken for it to pass through the column, is about one minute. The second peak, with a retention time of about 1.5 minutes, is the less volatile methyl benzene. Its peak has a larger area, showing that there is more of it in the mixture. The computer calculates accurate retention times and peak areas. The area under each peak is proportional to the amount of each component. The computer calculates this. This instrument is used for undergraduate practical sessions and samples are run singly as and when each student is ready. In this alternative instrument, the gas chromatograph is on the left and the detector is a mass spectrometer which runs the mass spectrum of each component as it comes out of the column. This can be particularly useful when analysing an unknown mixture, as the mass spectrum can help to identify each component. The combined technique is called Gas Chromatography Mass Spectrometry, GCMS. This GCMS instrument has an auto-changer for the samples. Many samples can be loaded up and run automatically, perhaps overnight.